Hello, everyone. I'm Erin Garcia from the California Historical Society. Um, thank you for joining our program, Shattering the Myths of Women in the West. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that the California Historical Society was founded in 1871, and so we're celebrating our 150th anniversary this year. Our mission is to inspire and empower people to make California's richly diverse past a meaningful part of their contemporary lives. I'm happy to mention that the, after being closed for most of the past year due to the pandemic, the CHS galleries are reopening, so please visit us. We have two shows on view, a new exhibition called San Francisco by photographer Minor White, and an ongoing show about early California that relates to today's topic, from the gold rush to the earthquake. Today's program is a talk with Wendy Vorsanger about her research on women in early California. Vorsanger is the author of the historical novel, Prospects of a Woman, and she manages the sheiscalifornia.net website a blog dedicated to chronicling the accomplishments of California women throughout history. Born and raised on the American River in Sacramento, Vorsanger started her career writing about technology for newspapers, magazines, and Fortune 100 companies in the Silicon Valley. She holds an MFA from the Vermont College of Fine Arts and is active in the Castro Writers Cooperative, the Lit Camp Advisory Board, and the San Mateo Public Library Literary Society. Today, she is going to talk about stereotypes of women in the West versus realities in early California, which actually allow women to redefine their roles. With that, let me turn it over to Wendy Borsanger. Wendy, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. I am a huge fan of the museum, and I didn't realize it was that your anniversary, so congratulations. That's really fantastic. Um, so anyway, I, I'd like to just go ahead and jump into my presentation um, that will explain sort of um, why the uh, myths of California and women in California and the gold rush in particular are quite inaccurate. So let me share my desktop here. Okay, so let's begin by talking about the myth of women in the early West. What is the myth? Well, Women need protection and guidance, were economically dependent on men and full of innate maternal instincts, and were completely content in the kitchen, baking, doing the dishes, having babies, that sort of thing. So where does this myth come from? Well, we're all familiar with this. Uh, the myth has originated in romanticized exaggerations, first in tall tales told mostly by men, first in newspaper stories, then in pulp fiction novels and Western movies written by men. And these are pulp fiction covers. And if you'll notice, most of the women are, are obviously very helpless, right? We're either on the railroad tracks tied up, we're falling off horses, we're grabbing onto men for help. And usually we have very uh, suggestive clothing on in a lot of these early Western novels. Now, if we're not those things, right, the myth is either the, the original, you know, sort of we're helpless or we're crazy, right? We're wild vixens, we're prostitutes, we need controlling by men. These are also some um, Pulp Fiction novel covers uh, and you'll see, you know, we're nasty, we're crazy. Um, this John Wayne uh, the McClintock cover here, this is actually a movie poster. And this is a fascinating one to me because this particular one, is set in California and this woman is wanting a divorce. And it was, it does not hold up well in history. I mean, it's quite horrifying. He runs around and grabs her and beats her. <laughs> so this is why we have these myths, right? Now also in, along with the mythology, it's, it's actually quite racist. Um, the novels in the West perpetuate racist stereotypes and the glory of manifest destiny, right? It has to be a scary place. Women have to be helpless. Therefore, the men are the brave, strong ones that sort of come in and save everything. So what was really going on in early California? Well, in 1850, a very liberal society was very fast emerging. There was a surge of immigrants, 750,000 or so in 1849, 1850, and there was a gender imbalance. It was 20 to one, 20 men to one women. And interestingly, there were new laws that protected women and gave women rights. I, I find this um, engraving here actually quite interesting. This, in this particular um, engraving, this man is 
allowing people, men in the mines to sort of gaze at his wife for money. <laughs> so there are so few women that you could actually make money doing that. I, I found that um, image very interesting. So what were the rights for women in 1850? Um, fascinatingly enough, no other state in the union gave women the right to sign contracts and own property. And this was guaranteed to us in the California constitution. Very quickly after in 1850, uh, there were counties throughout California that started allowing divorce, women to get divorced and to keep custody of their children. So that was actually the reality in California. So the question is, why did California grant women rights, right? And when you go back and you look at the history, we have to acknowledge the Californios. It's very important to acknowledge the Californios when considering women. So first, let me back up and talk about the Californios a little bit. They are the native Hispanic people who've resided here in California since the late 1600s. And they're made up of varying Spaniards, Mestizo, and indigenous Californios. And in 1849, at the California Constitutional Convention, delegates debated allowing women property rights separate from her husband. They discussed in great length the value of women to a society and the necessity of including rights for women in the California Constitution. Of the 48 delegates at the, at the Constitutional Convention, six were Californios, and they wanted to ensure that women in their family could continue to hold property and make contracts in their name since they had since 1776. So, oh, I, let me back up. I just wanna, I wanna explain this gentleman here, his name, he was Don Pio Pico. He was the last uh, governor under Alta California, under Mexican rule. He was a very wealthy man in California and um, he was disposed in, in uh, 1846 after the Mexican-American War, he was granted American citizenship. These are his nieces here in this, in this photograph. So I just wanted to clarify that. So California culture valued a woman's right to own property. At the California Constitutional Convention, one delegate said, it would be an unheard of invasion not to secure the rights of the wife to her separate property, where the civil law is the law of the land, where families have lived under it, where the rights of the wife are as necessary to be deemed as valuable as that of a husband. We must take into consideration the feelings of the native Californians who have always lived under this civil law, not the common law of England. So that's an important um, distinction to remember. California, the, the women's rights in California come from Spain, not from England, which um, the rest of the states sort of built their foundation on. So, so anyway, we have, we really do need to acknowledge the Californios in Californian history. And we need to understand that if it wasn't for their value of women owning property and being able to make contracts early on, we would never have had those rights. So another thing I would like to, um, this, the second reason I want to touch upon is that the, the white Americans that immigrated to California were very interested in having women be attracted to California. So they were, they, in their opinion, they thought, well, we'll go ahead and put these rights in, in the California constitution for women because that will get women to come to California, which I suppose that that was true. So who were the actual women in California? Well, with the new rights and without the slave labor of the South or the rigid class structure of the East, women enjoyed an economy and a society that afforded enormous opportunity. They were freed from expectations and traditions, and many women redefined their roles, grabbing independence and power. So you can see here in this uh, set of slides, women are doing a lot of things. <laughs> they're not in the kitchen. They're not being you know, helped by men. Um, in the center picture here, you can see a woman down with, um, with these three men with a long tom. She has actually bread that she's selling. And above that, you have a woman actually working a rocker box in the diggings, which I think is fascinating. Um, so here in this photograph, in these set of photographs, um, you also have women actually working, doing the gold mining. The, the, uh, the lineup of women here, they're actually hiking in Yosemite. 
And the illustration here, which I, on the on the far side with the women sitting around the table is fascinating. This is at the San Francisco Mint and they're actually um, counting out gold and, and measuring weighing gold. So I, I found that fascinating because the, you don't see these pictures, right? You, th these are not the women that are portrayed in the early Western literature. So I set out to try to understand who these women were and to create a more accurate and authentic narrative of women in California with prospects of a woman. Um, my story actually uh, tells the story of one woman's quest to carve out a life for herself in the liberal and bewildering society that emerged during the California gold rush frenzy. And it doesn't fall into the category of all the Western literature that we know. Um, it actually takes real women from California history. So let's talk about a few of those women. Um, there, it, the, I felt like in a way my novel <laughs> kind of wrote itself. There was, there are so many women in California that made enormous contributions to our state very early on, given the power dynamic that they found themselves in. And these are some of the women that inspired my the characters in my novel. There are four women that inspired uh, the main protagonist, Elizabeth Parker, and then there are lots of other women in the novel that. I took directly from actual women. So my protagonist, Elizabeth Parker, is sort of an amalgam of four separate women. Uh, one is Frances Gearhart. She was an extraordinary printmaker and watercolorist, as was her sister, but she was much more famous than her sister. Ina Coolbrith, most people um, know, she was a poet, a writer, and also the first poet laureate of the United States of America. Uh, Mary Foote was an author and illustrator, actually, um, her original diary was the inspiration for Wallace Stegner's angle of repose for one of the characters in that novel. And Josephine McCracken was a writer, a journalist, and an environmental activist, quite an extraordinary woman. She was very um, passionate about the Redwoods and um, uh, all up and down California, but specifically in Santa Cruz, she was instrumental in saving a, a whole group of Redwood groves down there in Santa Cruz. So some of the other characters in my novel, based on actual women. So this particular woman, um, Nancy Gooch, she was an extraordinary woman. She came to California in 1850. Uh, she was actually brought here by her slave master from Missouri. And when California came into the Union as a free state, he was run out of the town of Coloma, where they were on the American River. And she uh, kept working. She was a, a laundress. She she baked. She did um, homemaking skills, that sort of thing. And she started saving her money. And she bought land and started farming. She ended up saving up enough money to pay for her son and her daughter-in-law's freedom from Missouri. And they joined her. And she was one of the uh, largest landowners in California at the time. And it's quite extraordinary that she's an, a Black woman. Um, very impressive to me, and she is a character in my book. Uh, another character is Luenza Wilson. She was quite extraordinary. She was a, a woman in Nevada City who was a hotelier, and she, uh, she was not running a brothel. <laughs> she was running a, a restaurant and a hotel, and she actually became quite the mayoress of the town. She had a lot of power. She had um, many droves of hogs. She had she was married, but her husband spent most of his time digging, and so she kind of ran things and became quite wealthy. Her hotel burnt down, and she rebuilt it back up, and uh, she had enormous fortitude and grit and built it all from scratch on her own. So it was her, I think her story is quite impressive, and she is in my novel. I, I don't quite na have the same names because I take some historical liberties, but um, like I said, the no my novel kind of wrote itself. So Juana Briones, of course, most people know her. She's quite extraordinary ranching woman, California uh, landowner. Uh, she first had a ranch in San Francisco and divorced her husband. He was quite abusive and she had, I believe, seven or eight children. And she ended up raising them herself um, and becoming quite a very wealthy landowner and cattle rancher. And she's also in my novel, of course, not the same name. So Anne Bryman, she is fascinating to me. So she didn't fall in the category of sort of 1850, 1860, 1870. She was a little bit later in the 20s, but she is fascinating because I found her 
photographs to be absolutely mesmerizing. She would go into nature, get in the buff, and sort of pose, place herself in places like on trees or hugging trees or on rocks or in the water. And she would take uh, photographs of herself um, as self-portraits. This is one of them, which I find just absolutely ethereal. And so she is. She was an inspiration for one of the women in my novel. Um, so I also, in the epilogue in my book, it takes place very early on in Yosemite. And these pictures inspire that. You can see these women are, um, are out in nature. This is very, this is in the 1870s. And they're just kind of exploring. They're explorers. And it was a very... Um, undiscovered area uh, in that time during 1850, 1860, 1870, and at least by um, white Americans. And there were lots of women that went there um, to sort of be in nature, have an adventure. And this, these pictures, I think, to me, are just fascinating. So I think it's important to remember that California wasn't alone in granting women's rights. If you look at all, most of the Western states, they gave women the vote, the right to vote before the 19th Amendment, which was in 1920. Wyoming actually was the first state in 1890, Colorado in 1893. Only two states in the East actually gave women the right to vote before the 19th Amendment, and that was New York in 1917 and Michigan in 1918. So that came quite later. Uh, California, by the way, was 1911. And we, um, What's interesting is that when you look at all of the novels of the West, and then you look at this map, it's very confusing as to how we got the novels that we uh, that we have now in America. You know, 150 years of novels about conquering the West, because in these states in the West, women actually had enormous agency to vote, to uh, participate in business, to make contracts, to own property. And that's not reflected in very many novels of the West. So um, even now, modern novels of the West are still perpetuating these same uh, tropes and same tired stereotypes. Um, these are just some novels that have been written in the last 50 years. Um, the one in the upper right here, it's um, The News of the World, I find very interesting because this was written by Paulette Giles, and it's, it, it seems very innocent and very sweet, but it has some of the same tropes. You know, you've got this young girl, she, her family's attacked by Native Americans, and they're killed, so this white man has to come in and save her, and, um, you know, has to get her to safety, right? It's the same narrative that we've been seeing for the last 150 years. Um, and also, we have these modern, very confusing novels to me about Bri you know, Western brides or mail order brides, because it's just literally made up out of whole cloth. I mean, that I suppose in some instances that happened, but in most cases, um, w that was not actually <laughs> historically accurate. So I find those novels uh, particularly disturbing. So what are some novels that are subverting these old calcified myths of the Old West? Um, these a couple of these novels, obviously mine is on the right, Prospects of Woman, but Outlawed and How Much of These Hills is Gold, I'd like to talk about those for a moment. So How Much of These Hills is Gold is written by Pam Zhang, and actually I find it to be a very important contribution and addition to novels of the West because it tells the story of newly orphaned Chinese immigrants who are suddenly alone in late Gold Rush, California. So we have a California uh, woman who is of Chinese descent, uh, Chinese immigrant discussing sort of the her experience. And I think this is very, a very important contribution. It's an interesting book because it sort of explores race in the expanding West and it questions where immigrants are allowed to belong. And it's interesting to note that about 30% of the population in the gold rush country in 1850 was um, Chinese immigrants. So eventually these were, these people came, became Americans. So it's important to, that we have novels that reflect that. So I, I'm very excited about Pam's novel. It's a wonderful book. So then we have Anna's book here on the left, Anna North. This is a fascinating one because it's a revisionist literary Western. It tells an alternate history of the hole in the wall gang 
with the, the Jesse James sort of group. And it reimagines the gang as women, non-binary and gender fluid characters who team up after being persecuted for not being able to bear children due to a pandemic that's causing infertility. And I just found this book absolutely fascinating. Uh, it, it sort of turns the, you know, Western gangs on its head and it was so much fun to read. So I, I recommend both of those books. So then we also have these two, which I think are also amazing contributions to our canon about literature of the West. They're not set in California. Well, one of them is, but um, so Inland is set in Arizona and Taya's book is fascinating because it's, it shows an uh, unflinching frontiers woman in Arizona awaiting the return of her men, right? So she's alone waiting for her husband and her husband has gone, you know, in search for water. It's, there's a drought happening in Arizona and she basically has to kind of manage uh, holding down the fort while there's this mysterious beast stalking around. So it's very magical and interesting. And I find it um, a super uh, fun read and uh, kind of dreamy. I definitely recommend that. And then um, Hernan Diaz book here on the right, it actually was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. And it's about a young Swedish immigrant that finds, it, finds himself penniless and alone in California. And this one's interesting because he travels east, actually. So it's kind of a begin in the west, go east, um, traveling, you know, looking for his, bro his brother as all these other immigrants are coming west. So it's a fascinating sort of look about naturalists, criminals, religious fanatics, swindlers, and it basically defies the conventions of most historical fiction of the west by offering a look of, of very kind of stark look at the stereotypes that populate our past and it gives a, a portrait of sort of like what it means to be radically foreign in the west so the those two books i would definitely put on your list so also i want to um just close by saying if you are interested in california women and the the huge variety of California women that contributed to the building of our state and the building of the West. I highly recommend that you go to She is California. I am doing my best to uh, create a chronicle of as many women in the early West as I can, because it's absolutely fascinating. And there are so many, and they have um, really been left out of much of the literature of the West. So it's important that we remember them and that we create space for writers to tell their stories. So thank you. That, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen now and turn my video back on. Thanks, Erin. Great. Hi, Wendy. Thank Hi. you for that presentation. Um, that's very interesting. Um, I really, one of the things that I find so fascinating is this notion that um, you know, women were allowed, which plays such a huge role in what your book is about, um, that women were allowed to own property, real, real estate in California. And you talked in your presentation a bit about um, how uh, the Californios had a great deal to do with that. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about like what the reasoning was, why it was so important to the Californios, and then later um, even to American California, to, to give women rights like the vote and to other Western states to give women the right to vote. Why was it more important in the West and especially in California? Right, right. So I think in general, if you look at all the Western states, they were they really wanted a magnet, right, to bring women West. There weren't enough women. Um, there weren't enough women to sort of be with men. So the men wanted them here and they they needed their labor. They needed their skills. And I think it's very important to remember that that was what was going on, right? So we we have this construct in our mind, right, which has been fed to us, uh, co collected into our collective consciousness as Americans that well, all the women that came out here were prostitutes or wives, right? It's like, no, they weren't. Um, we were very valued in many, many states. So um, that's sort of the collective Western um, reasoning for wanting to get women West and, and wanting to pass voting rights for women. In terms of California and Californios, um, as you know, um, in 1776, Spain came and started developing their system of, of missions and the terrible genocide situation with the Native American Californians. They created this very rich sort of ranching life 
um, with cattle and um, it was very sort of uh, um, built around family and extended family. So their value was to sort of include women in that, right? So um, if men died and they didn't have a son, the land would go to their their wife or their daughters or their sisters. That's just kind of the way that they, that it was with the Californios. Um, so it, most people don't realize that that's actually the foundation of the rights for women in California. That's what it comes from. Yeah, I understand that with, that a lot of white men also came and married daughters of California families to get the land, you know, to become yeah. the effective owners of the land. So it is, it's a really interesting. Um, I also wonder about the, um, you know, the kind of racial implications of um, allowing basically white women the right to vote um, and things like that and the right to land ownership as a way of preventing, um, you know, other groups from having a great, other groups, namely uh, men of color, of having an equal say um, uh, and that brings me to another question. Um, can you discuss uh, the role of race a little bit in California land ownership in your book? Um, that comes up, you know, while the while the female character Elizabeth Parker has um, right on the claim that um, that she effectively inherited, but that her hus husband sort of owns. Um, but their partner, uh, California, is not allowed to. Um, become part of that claim school. Can you talk about what happened to the Californios after 1850? Right. In terms right. of land ownership? Yeah, that's a that's a big narrative and part of the narrative thread in my novel. So the uh, foreign miners tax was passed very quickly uh, as soon as the Americans figured out, oh, there's a lot of gold here and we want to decide who's foreign, right? Like all the white people from America that immigrated to California were considered you know, citizens, because we became a state. We're in 1850, we became a state. So everybody who'd been here for all this time was all of a sudden foreign, foreigners, right? This is like crazy town. So uh, the foreign miners tax was to, uh, you know, levied on everybody who wasn't sort of the white American, even if they came from Scotland, right? Even if they came from uh, England or Ireland or France, as long as they were white, didn't matter. It, it, they didn't even really have to be American. It was just considered for a foreign minor tax. And it was really just to, you know, to tax the Chinese um, and to tax people of Hispanic descent. Um, so the, um, yeah, that was, a, that was a huge problem. And then um, very early on, right as soon as we became a state, there was a lot of shenanigans regarding um, the deeds that the Californios had on their ranches. So they were asked to uh, prove, okay, how, how do we know you own this land? And they would ask them for a whole bunch of paperwork that they didn't have because that wasn't their system, right? They didn't have what the Americans considered proper deeds or whatever. So um, they went about sort of, um, uh, the Americans went about a very systematic way to try to um, sneakily grab their land. And they did in many cases. In um, a lot of cases, you know, uh, the Californios sort of tried as hard as they could to keep their land. In many cases, they um, had white women come and marry into their family. And in my narrative, it's actually the other way around, where a, um, a California marries a white woman. So it could, you know, it can go both ways. Um, yeah, so it it was very unfair, that's for sure. But then again, you know, the Na the Spaniards were also not fair to the Native Americans, and we have to acknowledge that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah, and there were lots of laws obviously preventing Chinese land ownership um, um, and other, among other um, laws against Chinese people. Um, so that's, so I think there's a lot there, you know, a lot of kind of complexity that uh, to sort out in, in what was, and you know, what was allowed and why and, and, um, and who yes. was had access to that power. Um, yeah, I mean, the Chinese know, Exclusion Act, the, the Chinese Exclusion Act, if I could just say one thing, that was a federal law, right, that affected California, but there were California legislatures that were pushing for that on the federal level, level so they could sort of prevent the Chinese from um, gaining land, which was a source 
or a path to power and wealth, right? But the Chinese Americans had an enormous contribution or made an enormous contribution very early on in California in building the railroad as farmers, in manufacturing, fishermen. So we need to acknowledge that as well. But there were laws that were preventing them for sure um, for, from owning land. Yeah. Um, so I, changing the subject a little bit here, um, I'm curious about some of your research. Um, I know you cited a lot of books um, and you showed us some of them. Um, were you able in your research to look at firsthand accounts? You even, you actually kind of create a letter um, that Elizabeth Parker, in your book, you're creating a letter that Elizabeth Parker write, or letter, a series of letters that she writes to her friend, Louisa May Alcott. Um, but I, it led me to wonder, were you able to read firsthand accounts of some of the women, for example, on your website, She is California, were you able, are you, have you been able to find that kind of material? Yes, there, there's, so in the last probably 20 years or so, maybe even a little bit longer, there have been a lot of nonfiction academic works um, done sort of collecting the stories of women of California. And um, it was, I found them all so interesting and fascinating. And there's so many that haven't been chronicled and told. So I spent a lot of time on the American River, uh, on the, you know, 49er Trail, I was born and raised on the American, so I'm sort of familiar with it. And I always love to go up there in the summer and swim. And I, I came across so many sort of raw pieces of data that weren't actually chronicled in academic works or, or um, nonfiction sort of um, accounts of women. But what I found the most interesting was the accounts from men that were, uh, I, I came across uh, many letters back home from men or even like journals where they were just so frustrated at the women, right? Like um, that was the most surprising thing to me because they're, they were very sort of perplexed and frustrated. Why are these women um, leaving? You know, why are they working? Why, why, why did she leave me and go with somebody else? Because that sort of um, relationship dynamic or power dynamic wasn't really happening in 1850 in the rest of the country. And so I found that fascinating. And some of the diaries or journals, I guess, from the men were the most interesting because they were so um, specific, you know, where the women would get angry and sort of throw things. And um, I, I don't know, I was very amused by that. I don't, I probably shouldn't have been, but I found it fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, obviously we are an archive and so we have some um, firsthand accounts from the gold rush. Um, it's, we don't always have both sides of the correspondence. That's a little bit rare. Um, but I think, uh, I don't think we have any of the, any firsthand accounts from any of the women that you mentioned. But, um, you know, I think it would be interesting to, to know if they had um, uh, written, you know, and some of them may be record, some of their, um, interviews uh, or writings maybe are in some of the academic texts that you mentioned. Yeah, I do have uh, a list actually. There. I do actually have a list on She is California and some of them are specific journal, you know, journal type um, entries. So you can check that out. Um, and in some cases they're not complete, right? My novel takes place in 1850. So a lot of my, um, a lo some of the writings came later, you know, from women came yeah. later. Um, but right. a lot of the raw stuff that I read was really interesting <laughs> and, oh, <laughs> you know, written very poorly by men and women, you know, who weren't maybe very educated and it was fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. I do think I, I really love Westerns and, um, I found it really gratifying to kind of immerse myself in a story told from uh, a female perspective, especially a story that um, was so full of adventure and, Kind of you know agency and resilience that she had um, but of course with anything you know in this period I'm always thinking about um, the native people that you mentioned um, who are obviously facing what what we now consider to be a genocide um, and we lack firsthand written accounts from native people from that era and I think it's um, obviously a real challenge as um, an organization that works you know that's trying to um, illuminate history. Um, and so I wonder if you have thoughts on this and how we can better sort of represent Native people's perspective and stories um, from this time in California, this really, you know, truly challenging time for them. In right. California. Right. Yes. I, so first of all, I 
definitely agree with you. We need to somehow figure out a way to get more uh, Native American voices, California Native voices into literature. Um, I think that it bringing your perspective as a Native American would be very, very important. And I, I, it, it frustrates me that there's not more Native American writers out there that are getting the book deals, that are getting their stories told. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. So when I, um, there, I have a few Native American women in my book, and I was very concerned about sort of how to portray them. And I had a sensitivity reader work with me when I was finished to sort of, um, help me portray um, the historical accuracy of the times versus, um, you know, and not shading that honesty versus any unconscious bias or anything like that. And I think that was really important. But I think when it comes down to it, we need Native American women telling stories about the West. End of story. So publishing houses need to, you know, value those voices. And, you know, we have Joy Harjo that, you know, obviously she was the, uh, Poet Laureate and, you know, her book Crazy Brave is amazing and uh, Louise Erdrich is great. But if you think about California in particular, there's not a lot of women. I mean, I know there was a tribal memoir, I think it's called Bad Indians, that was written by an Ohlone. That was pretty fascinating kind of uh, modern look at sort of Native American life in California. But I, there's just not money. And I think that, um, so Tommy Orange, he, I believe he lives in Oakland. And um, he didn't, he's not a native Californian. I think he is a Cheyenne. I think he grew up in o Oklahoma, maybe. Um, but he's doing some work with students to try to get Native American stories out. Uh, there's also David Troyer at USC. Um, he is an Obije, I believe, um, from the uh, Northeast, um, Native American. And he's trying to get stories out of USC from, you know, native voices. But it's, it's challenging. And I, I think there needs to be a value um, spoken value in the within the publishing house they need to go look for those voices because yeah. they would i think add a very very important lens to the history of california and literature of the west yeah yeah i agree um thank you um i have one last um topic that i want to bring up um there's a you know sexuality plays a fairly significant role in your book and um in terms of both, you know, kind of um, female desire and or heterosexual female desire, but also homosexual desire. And, and so um, male, female, homosexual desire. And so I just thought of the research you did that led, you, that inspired or informed um, that aspect of your, or those aspects of your book. Right, right. Well, um, okay, so for me, first of all, my family's seventh generation Californian, and what I found what I found fascinating is to just go back and look at the women in my family, right, first and foremost. And I think that the agency and the power that women have in my family um, definitely sort of overflowed into their sexuality. And in my in my narrative, I wanted to, and, and I feel like that is true actually in California now as it was in 1850. And I wanted to reflect that accurately, that a woman's power is not just her economic power and her independence, right? To be able to make a living not connected to a family or a man, but also sort of what pleasure in life is and what, what she chooses to do with her body. And so that, that to me was a very honest narrative. But in terms of the gay life and the diggings, that didn't, San Francisco didn't just end up, you know, in the 70s with a, you know, a foundation of homosexual, a vibrant homosexual life, right? This began in the 1850s. So and there's been some academic work looking at the, the life in, the gay life sort of in, um, on Highway 49, and particularly down in the Southern Mines and like, around Sonora, sort of the entrance into Yosemite, that area down there was a little bit more raucous and had um, a little bit more um, sort of availability to um, live alternative lives. And not that like tons of people were out, but it, it was a thing, right? And that's something that hasn't been explored. Um, so I don't know, does that answer your question? Yes, it helps. I mean, I think it's useful for people to, um, uh, be pointed to sources that show, you know, that, um, that serve kind of as evidence of that early history of right. gay life and, and, um, cause so much of that history becomes, um, 
hidden, you know? And yeah. I mean, we, yeah, so it's um, really interesting to think about how uh, we can um, illuminate that part of part of California's history. Um, right. Greater you, know, you know, what's interesting, Erin, is um, I think people, because we have this construct in our mind, right, which has been pushed into us for so long that, you know, brave, brave men, helpless women, nobody was gay, right? It's hard to kind of imagine anything else, right? Because that's been fed to us for all these years. In the back of my novel, um, I have a page of sort of all the um, uh, nonfiction books that I read as a researcher that I included it in there. So people can look at that for, for sources. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I believe that most of the literature of California or of the West is portrays women absolutely um, incomplete. Yes, and men apparently <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, I think, and it was also, it's also interesting to think about, you know, the man that um, has his leg. Well, I don't want to give too much right. away, but um, that people with disabilities were um, part of the story of early California too, because of course conditions were not, um, did not lend themselves to safety. So, right. um, yeah. So right. I, think I think it was a very of, rugged you know, place, right? Yeah, it was a very yeah. rugged place and it was, it was, um, it was harsh in terms of, there was no infrastructure, right? There are very few towns. So people had to sort of make it on their own and there were dangers and people could get sick or become maimed or, you know, lose limbs, that sort of thing. And um, yeah, I have, a, I have a disabled character in my book. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Wendy, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much for giving us your time. And um, we look forward to seeing what you do next. Thank you so much, Erin. And congratulations, yeah, to, to the museum. I love it. I, I'm so excited that you guys are open again. Um, and I'm going to come and see the new exhibit. And I'm really excited that COVID is hopefully like opening things up. And I'm thrilled. Yes, it will be great to open back up. <laughs>